morning, everybody, or at least it's morning for me when I'm recording this program about orchids. What is it with orchids? It seems that everybody loves orchids, and in nature, surprisingly, they seem to grow everywhere, although we really aren't conscious of that, I suppose. Even right here in Ohio, we can find an assortment of orchids. And they're all so beautiful. You can see here the lady, lady slipper orchid on the introductory slide. It's just magnificent. And I think that's here in Ohio. Most of us, when we see these plants, just stare at them in, in wonder, at least I do. And I'm going to tell you the story today of something about orchids. And I'll start my story today with my daughter, who lives in New York State, and she has an orchid in her living room. And she's had this orchid for years, which is, and she doesn't have any clue as to her success in keeping this orchid alive and keeping it growing. And yet, somehow, some way, she's doing something right. And so, when I first saw that some time ago, it was really a source of fascination. And I remember sitting in the living room, because that's where she had it, on a living room table, in a window, uh, facing a Western view. And I would just sit there enamored with this thing, particularly if it was in bloom. Sometimes it wasn't in bloom other times of the year. So I want to show you a little bit more of that orchid and I think I just press this. Ah, and there is the orchid, sort of dormant situation. Oh, just coming out of dormancy. That's the same orchid that I've been talking about. This particular one, she has it on her dining room table, facing an eastern exposure. I think she puts it there in its dormant situation. Not that she has a plan. Not that she knows that this is going to make it flower. It's just a matter of convenience in, in running the house. Notice it looks kind of dead. Those look like twigs up there. Nothing particularly appealing about it. Oh, but wait a minute. There's some green down at the bottom. You can notice those are leaves. And this is the living vegetative part of this. And what we're going to get up above are the flowers. And the next slide will show them in the flowering condition. This is this past fall, uh, probably sometime in November. You notice the leaves are off the tree. This is in the living room window now. You can see a couple of Christmas cactus down low on the windowsill. They're not part of our talk today. It just happens to be the way she has her flowers arranged. But there's the orchid that you saw in the previous slide in the dormant stage. Here it is now in full flower. Orchids are so fickle and so difficult to grow. And so when we used to visit her there, and I'd see this thing blooming at various times of the year. I'd just sit next to that living room table, sort of enchanted <laughs> by what I was looking at, and, and just staring at this marvel. I can show it to you a few weeks later. You'll see snow on the ground now, but it's a better picture of the flowers. Same orchid, same window, same Christmas cactus, but now you can see it has been snowing. And look at those blossoms on a winter day. So to see that orchid in that situation is really very exciting. And over the years, when we'd visit, we would see it in its various stages of its life cycle. This, of course, is the most exciting part of the cycle. And so what is it with orchid? 
what, 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 what is the wonderment and the sense of awe that we all feel when we see orchids? We know how difficult they are to grow. It's so unusual to see something like this picture shows. And my daughter's first to admit she has no idea what causes this and what, why this spot is so perfect. Is it the light, the western light? Is it the humidity? Is it the temperature? Is it some strange combination of factors, some of which you don't even know, that results in this display? No one really knows. They're very, very difficult to grow. And there are, what I want to tell you today is that there are so many of these in nature, uh, more than 25,000 species of orchids. Can you imagine? I would never have guessed there were so many in the world. I thought they were relatively rare, and in a sense they are. But still, there are 25,000 some odd species of orchids on this earth. They're really quite a diverse uh, family of flowering plants. I recently read that if you consider all the orchid species that there are in the world and total them up, that that number is greater than the number of mammal plus the number of birds plus the number of reptile species combined. I didn't know that. That's, that's incredible. I thought they were rare, and they are rare where you see them and so delicate, but there are a lot of orchids in this world, and who would have guessed that? I'm going to try and show you some of these today. Uh, new ones are being discovered, but I can't say it's all the time. It's rare that new ones are discovered. They are so precious and so rare. Actually, scientifically, if you look at the numbers of species of orchids, there's about 200 species all together native here, right here in North America, and some of those are right here in Ohio. Well, orchids, as do most plants, begin their lives as seeds, and right off the bat we have our first problem with orchids. The seeds are almost microscopic. They are so small that when you look at them under a microscope or with a powerful hand lens, you notice that they are, they contain very little onboard food substances to maintain the brand new orchid that might spring from that seed. Think, for example, of a bean seed. You've all seen bean seeds. They're big and they're sort of oblong in shape. And if you look at them, break them open, and look at the two halves, you see the little embryo, the future bean, over on one side, and all the rest of it is filled with kind of a, a white, yellowish substance, which is hard, semi-hard, and that's made up of proteins and carbohydrates and fats, which represents the food supply for the growing embryonic bean until such time that it has a root system and a leaf system when it can do for itself. Orchids have none of that. The seeds are so tiny, as I say, almost microscopic. There is no onboard food supply for the new developing orchid. So, <clears throat> when an orchid seed lands on suitable soil, A specialized relationship is established between the orchid and, get this, a fungus. Who would have guessed? This relationship is such that this specialized fungus provides a food source for the developing orchid embryo, which it doesn't possess on its own. This is a very, very close, mutually beneficial relationship. It's a symbiosis, as we would say in biology, where one species promotes and helps 
in the maintenance of another species, in this case, in the reproduction of a new orchid. And as far as I know, that's true for all orchids, that there is this symbiotic relationship between a fungus and the orchid. Most of us, when we think of a fungus, we think, ooh, I don't like that. They're bad business. They're not helpful. But here's a case where they are, whatever this fungus is, and I suppose it's different species which can promote the germination and the development of a brand new orchid plant. So the seeds are very small, as I say, almost microscopic. But you see, that's perfect for dispersal. The slightest breeze will carry them away and spread out the territory which this particular orchid will then occupy. What a beautiful way in which it works. I want to tell you a story <clears throat> about when I taught at Heidelberg College in Tiffin, Ohio. And this will involve orchids, believe it or not. In the 1970s, it's a long time ago, we instituted at that, in our biology department, a summertime field course, which was to occur the day after graduation. And we called it the biology of unusual habitats. And its purpose was to offer a course in the early summertime, about 10 days, where a group of students usually around 15, very seldom any more than that, would be taught at a mountain retreat in West Virginia in a seven, eight day course, camping, living out in the wild, in the mountains, cooking our own meals over fires and in tents and building a latrine and a field kitchen, which was a old used army gas our field kitchen to study the flora and the fauna of the Appalachian Mountains. That's what we call an unusual habitat for flatland Ohio, as you know. There were only five professors. One was a geologist. The rest of us were biologists. And I really wasn't a field biologist. I was more uh, animal physiologist, human physiologist, but I did not teach the areas of field biology. But I went along on the trip anyway, sort of acting as the coordinator and producing the daily roster of work for everybody, and what we're going to do, taking care of the groceries and things of that kind. Whereas the rest of the staff, they were experts in ornithology, in field zoology, in plants, of all kinds, and a geologist to study the mountains. So each year in our study of unusual habitats, we would devote one day to a very unusual habitat, and that was a freshwater bog. A freshwater bog is an old lake or an old pond over which vegetation has grown and taken root and you don't really know when you look at this field of growing plants that there's water underneath it. But when you step out onto the bog, it begins to sag under your weight. So each step you take gives way and it produces a very strange sensation. And some people have to get used to that. And everyone has to work on that particular problem. The reason we did this, and we called it a bog walk, is because the plants on a bog are so different than other, other kinds of plants. And we wanted students to, to learn about that habitat. And the freshwater wetland habitat with its vast array of very specialized plants, which includes the heaths, which are both shrubs and grasses, all the mosses, particularly the sphagnum mosses, a, a whole assortment of carnivorous plants, a jack in the pulpit, 
and other pitcher plants and sundew and Venus traps. All of these are carnivorous plants and of course orchids because it turns out that an upland freshwater bog is rich in lots of very different kinds of plants but orchids are very special in that environment. Now, it takes a certain amount of courage to get out on a bog and walk. The problem is that every once in a while your foot goes through and the whole thing is kind of undulating and it produces a sense of it's not very real and it takes a while for the students and the faculty too to get used to that kind of feel. It's not dangerous but it's disquieting to walk along and all of a sudden your right leg plunges through the surface and is now in water up to your knees, maybe. <clears throat> that's a fresh water bog. Well, that's a glimpse into my past, and I want to show you a picture of one of our students in those years who is in her fresh water bog barrel. Her name is Janice, and there she is. You can see other students in the background couple of them hanging on to each other, but there's Janice and she's just discovered right at her right leg, look down at the bottom of her right leg, she's found a whole bed of orchids. Not in bloom, <laughs> it was a long time of year for the bloom, but she's found them and she is really pleased with herself. That was on a bog walk in West Virginia field trip in 1977, that was the year she graduated. So a bog is a wetland that accumulates dead plant material and that dead plant material uh, really becomes a massive carbon sink. Now you're all familiar with a sink where water goes in. You put water in the sink and if you pull out the plug it disappears. Well. We use the term scientifically in other ways. A carbon sink is, a, is an environment in which carbon accumulated in growing plants which die off can sink and disappear. And this goes on for millions of years and one of the upshots of that is that in our times we've discovered huge amounts of coal and sometimes amounts of oil. That is the result of the carbon sink, the conversion of these old, ancient, organic plant substances undergoing this profound change called the carbon sink, which eventually stores all that carbon and its energy as coal and oil. So here's the chance where we study the carbon sink, but the most important thing we were looking for was orchids that day. What I want to do, that's enough of my past, what I want to do now with you is to look at some different kinds of, of orchids to give you a sampling of the diversity, the strangeness of, of these plants, maybe some that you've never seen before. This is our first one. It's called the bee swarm orchid. I don't know why it's called that. Maybe bees swarm around it, I don't know. It's also called a cigar orchid. I can't imagine why. Some people call it the cow, the cow horn orchid. Scientifically, it's Citropodium punctatum. I'm going to use a lot of scientific names because these common names are crazy. It's okay for one part of the country, but when you look at people studying orchids worldwide, it, to call some orchid the cigar orchid, nobody knows what that is, but everybody in the field would know what Cryptopodium punctatum is. It's this orchid that you see here. It's a native of Florida, and it's also found in Mexico, not surprisingly. It's even found as far south as, as, as towards the southern ends of Argentina. It was once common in swamps and wetlands, but in Florida today, it's nearly extinct and it's destined to become extinct in the next few years. The bee swarm orchid.
Here's another one. Can you believe it? Look at that blossom. I mean, it's, it's, it's just breathtaking. It's unbelievable. I mean, compare it in your mind to a tulip or a pansy. It's the fairy slipper orchid. That's its common name. Scientifically, Calypso bulbosa. It's also called the Venus's slipper orchid. The genus name for this, which is Calypso, comes from the Greek word indicating concealment. This orchid is really hard to find in its natural habitat, which turns out to be a conifer forest. It's just unbelievably beautiful. Cypripodium punctatum. Here's the showy lady slipper orchid. Some call it the fairy queen orchid. Another name for it is the white winged moccasin orchid. <laughs> and another name for it is the royal lady's slipper orchid. And its scientific name, Cypripedium regina. The reason for scientific names, which you always know are two parts called binomial names, a genus, first name, and a species. Everyone in the world working in this field know Cypripedium regina, but not everyone in the world knows the fairy queen orchid or the white winged moccasin orchid or the silver slipper orchid or the royal lady slippers orchid or the showy ladies slipper orchid. Maybe that helps you understand why the whole realm of scientific notation has developed because scientists, botanists, working have to know what they're talking about in order to talk to each other. But isn't that a beautiful orchid, the showy lady slipper orchid? It's fun to say they're common names too. <clears throat> this is the spider orchid. <clears throat> Scientifically, Brasia caudata. It's found in the warmer parts of the Western Hemisphere. It's also called the cricket orchid. I have no idea why it's called a cricket orchid. Maybe somebody one time saw a cricket on it and decided it was the cricket orchid. And sometimes it's called the tailed brazia orchid, which gets a little closer to its scientific notation of brazia caudata. But, but what, what I'm getting from these pictures, and I hope you're starting to see too, is the variability of orchids. We all have a concept of what an orchid is. We think of an orchid corsage, for example, which is a particular kind of orchid. This shows you the enormous variability of these flowering plants. This, this particular orchid, the spider orchid, is a very difficult orchid to grow. There's always a temptation. People want to grow them. And even people who very specialize in greenhouses and know how to grow things want to grow them. There's a demand for them economically, but they are so difficult to grow. And the reason I've already told you, but you may have forgotten, is this relationship between the orchid and a fungus. Each, it seems, each of the orchids have to have in the soil around them a symbiotic fungus. And this one is no different. It's an, this particular orchid is a um, epiphytic orchid. Uh, and, and some time ago, in one of my earlier talks, I talk about epiphytes and epiphytic relationships. And you've probably forgotten what that is. Uh, it's a situation where one plant grows on another plant, but not to harm it, not to use it. 
but to just grow on it and derive nutrition from what might accumulate on that plant. Think of Spanish moss. We talked about that some talk earlier. Spanish moss, you find it on those old southern oak trees hanging down. It's very romantic and very typical of a southern habitat. And that is that, that moss is an epiphyte. Well, this particular spider orchid that you see here is also an epiphyte. It grows on something else, not to the detriment of that something else, but to the benefit of the other particular orchid. And we find that quite often, but not all orchids, of course, are epiphytic, but this particular one is. The next orchid is called a stream orchid, that's S-T-R-E-A-M, stream orchid. Epipactus gigantica, other common names for, the common names for it are the giant heliborine. I don't know where that comes from. And some people call it the chatterbox orchid. I have the foggiest notion why anybody would call an orchid a chatterbox. But that's what it is. It's scientific name, Epipactus gigantea, which suggests it's a pretty big orchid, <laughs> and it is. It's native in Western North America, and you find it most abundant along the Pacific coast and along river banks that rivers that drain into the ocean. And also, curiously, along in, in areas that are hot springs, certain hot springs, this particular orchid will go. Epipactus gigantea. The leaf structure, I hope you're taking that in as we go along. I haven't mentioned it. The leaves all have a sort of an elongate quality to them. And they all look pretty much alike, except for coloration. Here it's a purplish, greenish combination. That is the stream orchid. It's a common name. Okay, <clears throat> we're coming to the most famous orchid of all. I mentioned it to you, um, <clears throat> oh, quite a while ago. I think I was talking about sugar and spice and everything nice, question mark. Do you remember that talk? <clears throat> we talked about vanilla, one of the spices that was discovered by the ancient Portuguese, Dutch, English, French explorers in the South Sea Islands. This is the orchid that produces real vanilla. Its scientific name, vanilla planifolia, the orchid that yields vanilla. It's native apparently to, to Mexico, which leads to quite an interesting story. Somehow it got to the South Sea Islands probably long before humans were involved in trying to cross the Pacific in their outrigger canoes. And that's where the European explorers found it. But in reality, it's a native plant to Mexico. And it, another unusual quality about it is that it grows as a vine. Not many orchids grow as a vine. And I'll show you that in just a moment. Uh, what that looks like. The flowers, they only last a day. It's unbelievable. These beautiful things last such a short time. And in order to get a steady flow of flowers and, and the fruit of those flowers, humans have learned how to hand pollinate them. And is it intensely hard work, very labor intensive, and therefore real vanilla is expensive. It com the vanilla comes from the seeds of this plant, and I'll show you those in just a moment. The story of this plant, here's what we think we know. In Mexico, prior to the Aztec civilization, there was a cluster of Indians called the Totonic Indians. And they 
learn how to enjoy vanilla, they learned how to grow vanilla, and they learned how to pollinate these plants so that they would be seed producing and they would be able to harvest the vanilla. It was the Teutonic Indians that did that. North of the Teutonic Indians, another culture was growing on about the 15th century, 14th century. A cluster of other Indians called the Aztecs who would become dominant and who would, as you might expect, conquer the Teutonics, but not before they learned about vanilla. And what were those Teutonic Indians did? They combined the vanilla with chocolate. And apparently this was a real wow drink for these people and everybody wanted it, including the Aztecs. So after they had conquered the Teutonic Indians, the Aztecs, to make a long story short, took over the whole growth industry of, of growing vanilla orchids, probably using Teutonic slaves to do the job for them. And so they acquired the vanilla, so-called vanilla industry. However, those greedy Aztecs would get their comeuppance, as you all know. One day, a guy came along, he was a Spaniard, and his name was Hernando Cortez. And he arrived in Mexico, and he saw this incredible population of Indians, the Aztecs and their buildings and all the glory of the Aztecs, and was filled with jealousy. So he went about eliminating the Aztec Indians, and then he got to taste vanilla. And he got, he decided he would take these orchids and he would take them back to Spain. And once they got back to Spain, the whole idea of vanilla took off. You can imagine the proverbial cat was out of the bag, and it wasn't very long before Europeans were transplanting vanilla orchids all over the place. I mean, they went to Madagascar, which they already owned, and planted it. They went to the Seychelles Islands, and they planted or vanilla orchids. They went to the Comoros Islands in the Indian Ocean and planted more of the vanilla orchids, just to name a few of the places where they planted it. And yet, no matter what they did, the work involved in producing vanilla was extremely, very, very labor intensive. It was chancy, and therefore it made the product quite expensive. So that all boils down to the economics of vanilla, and we all know even today, that natural vanilla is quite expensive. The thing is, chemists, you know, better living through chemistry, chemists have learned what vanilla is, and it turns out it is a six carbon ring structure, a phenol, which has certain carbon units added onto it, which produces this incredibly tasting material that we call vanilla which is great in our ice cream and all other kinds of places. My wife tells me, well, you don't buy pure vanilla. You buy the synthetic vanilla, which is half the price. It's because we know the chemical formula and we can make an exact replica chemically of the natural occurring vanilla. But it comes from an orchid. I wanna show you another picture of this orchid, how it grows naturally. It's a vine. You can see it going up that tree. Vanilla planifolia grows as a vine. Production of natural vanilla is extremely labor intensive. To get a steady flow of fruit, the orchid flowers must be hand pollinated. The resulting fruits, which are long pods, which I'll show you in a moment, they mature in about five months, and then they have to be harvested and cured for many more months. This is part of the enormous expense of natural vanilla. Let's take a look at that fruit. You're gonna be surprised. Pods, who would have guessed? They're beans inside those pods. Each pod comes from a hand pollinated flower, which then has to be dried, 
and cured for several months to intensify the flavor of vanilla. You begin to get the odor of vanilla from them. And that's what, why real vanilla extract is so expensive today. There are several artificials, as I just mentioned earlier, because we now know it's a phenolic compound. So those are the pods, and in, in those pods are beans. It's the beans where you find the, the vanilla. Okay, a few more slides. Here's the pink lady slipper orchid. Cypripedia macaulay is the name. It's here in Ohio. It's also called the moccasin flower. I, I don't know why it's called a moccasin flower. I don't, it doesn't look like a moccasin to me, but you know, it's, it goes as far west, I believe, in the United States as Wisconsin. The Mississippi River seems to be the borderline. It doesn't seem to cross over into the states west of the Mississippi River. But here it is in Ohio. Cypripedia macaw. Here's the showy orchid, Galea spectabilis, found in the eastern Canada, down the east coast of the United States through the woodlands, and even here into Ohio, which is probably its farthest reaches. And look at that leaf. I think some worm has been eating that leaf. How delicate these flowers are. And you notice anatomically, I'm not going into the anatomy of these flowers, it's such a complex topic, it's a topic in itself, but you can see the delicacy of, of the blossom and the complexity of that blossom. It's a whole science in itself. Here is the large yellow slipper orchid in Ohio, Cypripedium parviflorum, the large yellow slipper orchid. It's one of the most common wild orchids in the United States, and it, ex it exists, <laughs> and this makes it so complicated, in three different varieties, one of which, this one, lives in the Ohio soils. hard for me to keep the picture on the screen, which you're seeing, and the text that I'm trying to relate. So I'm back and forth a lot, so sorry about that. And then I'm going to show you the pink lady slipper orchid. I couldn't resist. I know I've showed it before. Look at those two specimens. Another view of the pink lady slipper orchid. Found east of the Mississippi River, not in Florida, however, too warm. Seed requires a fungus, same story I told you earlier, but this is even, even more curious. This, this seed won't even germinate without the fungus. It, to, the seed, to break the seed open requires the fungus. Who would have guessed this kind of a relationship between a lowly fungus and a beautiful orchid? This, pink lady slipper orchid. So it's, it's not just breaking open the seed, but it becomes a, a lifelong relationship, actually. Uh, and this particular orchid can take 20 years to grow from seed to a sexually mature organism. It's, it's unbelievable. 20 years for that to happen. I mean, how utterly precious such an organism is, and here you see it in its full bloom, two plants. And that sort of brings me to the end of this, but I want to tell you something. There's the pink lady slipper orchid that you just saw. It's so clever. It's, the, the design is so unbelievable. In the front of that floral display, the pink reddish area, where you see the bee very close, there's a slit. It's a very tiny slit. And the bees, attracted by one, the color, and two, the odor, to which they are overpoweringly attracted, go in the slit. 
But guess what? They can't get out of the slit. So the only way out is to go through a forest of thread-like projections, each loaded with pollen. So they have to wander through this forest of projections with pollen. They get their bodies covered with pollen and there's a back door and they can go out and carry the pollen away. I mean, talk about adaptations. So this was the talk I want to give you on orchids. It's such a vast subject. Uh, I, I can't even come close to covering it. I don't know enough about it to even try to cover it. But this means to give you a little idea of kinds of orchids, the, the look of them. And I think you'll all agree that they're they're really magnificent in their appearance. So welcome to the family of Orchidaceae. That's what they're called scientifically. And that is the end of this presentation. Thank you.